I just no, I just invite you to stand if you would like to as we uh, sing our first song see a victory we are going to see a victory no weapon formed against us shall prosper Yeah. 
victory for the battle belongs to you lord i'm gonna see a victory i'm gonna see a victory for the battle belongs to you lord i'm gonna see i'm gonna see a victory i'm gonna see a victory Good morning, Community Reform Church. Good to see everybody this morning. My name is Chris. I'm one of the pastors here on staff. We also want to say good morning to all of you joining us on Facebook this morning. We sure are glad that you're all here and with us and worshiping Jesus this morning from this space and this time. Pastor Chip is actually on vacation today. Uh, it might not be the kind of vacation he wants. He's touring colleges with his son, John. If you can believe it or not, John is going to be graduating next year already. It just seems like he was just a little one running around here, doesn't it? But uh, that's where Pastor Chip is. Uh, just have two quick announcements I want to share with you this morning uh, before we step into worship this, uh, this morning. First, uh, just to get on your calendar, we do have a outdoor picnic that is scheduled for us on September 12th. That's actually the day we're coming back inside from our outdoor worship services, and we have an incredible uh, time that we are planning out there. It kind of reminds me of one of those old school uh, picnic kind of things. We've got some, some things, but the, the best thing that we have going is Pastor Chip is going to be in a dunk tank. So that's going to be really fun. And so if you want to see Chip get dunked, uh, that will be a, a good time on September 12th here. Uh, more details uh, will be coming for that. Just make sure we get that on your calendar. Second and last announcement today is uh, we are collecting school supplies. Safe Haven Ministries are uh, to help those uh, kids that need some extra supplies in their repertoire headed back to school. And so that collection has begun. There is a giant red trailer out in our back parking lot and there's a little handle door on there if you want to uh, grab extra supplies while you're at the, the store and then just drop them off in that calendar or not in that calendar, in that trailer, uh, that would be great. All right, let's uh, say a word of prayer as we enter into worship this morning. 
Jesus, thank you for being so good to us. Thank you for your love, your kindness. Thank you for reaching down when we didn't deserve it, Jesus. Thank you for pulling us up from wherever we were in our life to be in relationship with you and to forgive us of all of the, the mistakes that we have made in our life. In this morning today, let us not lose track of that amazing gift of grace that you gave us. So as we sing, as we listen, I just ask that your Holy Spirit remind us of those truths of your love, that your Holy Spirit is challenging our hearts and growing us to, to walk closer to you. Use this space to speak to all of our hearts, I pray, Jesus. Amen. Amen. I want to invite you to stand if you would like to as we just continue to worship. Lord, you are worthy. You are worthy of all of our praise, God, and we just give you all our praise this morning, Lord. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. He is worthy. Amen this morning. Breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. 
one like you there is none beside you open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me and holy there is no one like you there is none beside you open up my eyes in wonder and Sing 
come to the altar. Oh, come to the altar. say a word of prayer as we enter into this this time of learning. Jesus, thank you so much. Thank you so much that you've given us the Holy Spirit to open up our minds, to open up our hearts, so that we can open up your scripture and learn from it. It amazes me, God, that through the work of the Holy Spirit, that you are able to speak to each and every one of us in this space right now, however you choose to do that. And so, Jesus, I just pray that you open up our hearts to hear what you have to say to us this morning. Grateful that we have this opportunity to be together, to worship you as a body of Christ in this space, in this moment. So, Jesus, we're yours. Use us now, we pray. Amen. All right. So we just left uh, our first summer series outside where Chip spent several weeks talking about the prophets. And today we get to step into a, a new thought process, a new sermon series called The Priorities of Jesus. And that statement alone is really a fun one to think about. In fact, even uh, when Chip asked me to do this sermon series, he came in and said, hey, will you do the opening ser uh, sermon to the, the priorities of Jesus? And I said, sure. What are the priorities of Jesus you want me to talk about? And he said, I don't know. What do you think the priorities of Jesus are? I was like, I don't know. You're the pastor. You tell me. What are the priorities of Jesus? And if you know Chip and I, we had a fun little banter back and forth there. And he left going, you come up with what you think the biggest priority of Jesus was. And so I thought about that, spent some time thinking about, well, what are the priorities of Jesus? And there's lots of them. If we spend time to start to digest, we could talk about service. We could talk about Jesus giving us peace. We could talk about uh, our money. We could talk about all kinds of things. But today we're going to concentrate on what I believe is the foundational building block to what the priorities of Jesus are. It's foundational because it is actually built into the very character and nature of God himself. And 1 John says it this way, that God is love. And so if we want to understand who Jesus is, who God is, who the character and nature of God is, and what his priorities are for us I think we need to foundationally understand what the concept of love is and how that plays out in our life as followers of Jesus. But before we can actually step into the scriptures and understand what, what the, the passage we're going to be looking at today in Matthew, what that is saying, we need to do just a little bit of homework. And this might be homework that you've heard in the church before. If you've been around, you've probably heard some of these words. If this is your first time, you're about to get, step into a fun little Greek lesson, but it's important that we understand how the terminology of love is used in scripture. And I actually want to recommend a book to you. C.S. Lewis has an incredible work on this. It's called The Four Loves. 
And C.S. Lewis does an amazing job uh, talking about what the concepts of love are in the Bible. And so if you're looking to really just step into and learn and grow about what this concept of love is in the Bible, because it's a, a lot bigger than we think it is. It's a great resource for you by C.S. Lewis. I recommend it. So here's our, our Greek lesson for the day. Because in Scripture, love is not something that is a universal word like we use it for today. We use the word love frequently. We toss it around, and love is love. We, we love green beans on our plate. Well, my kids don't, but I, you know. But, you know, we also love our wife, and we love our kids. There's all these different ways that we say we love, but Scripture delineates between love. It actually has four different terms in Scripture that they use for love, and the first one is eros. And that word is usually meaned with, uh, 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 it's, it, the, <laughs> as I say here, it's a love of a sexual nature. It's that erotic kind of love that it's used. There's also uh, the Greek word storhe, and that word here is, that's kind of that love of family, that bond that is created uh, between uh, family members. Then there's a third kind of love called philia, and that is that friendship kind of love. It's fun to watch uh, some of you walk into church and embrace one another and smile and get excited because that's that philia, that kinship of friendship that is between you and someone else. That is a, a great kind of love to like see and witness between friends. But then there's agape kind of love. Agape love is a sacrificial. This is the kind of love that we actually see with Jesus on the cross, that Jesus was willing to sacrifice his life so that we could be in relationship with God the Father. And that sacrificial kind of love is this agape kind of love that the Bible talks about. And so we're going to need to know what those four terms are as we step into our scripture because we need to know what kind of love that they're actually talking about in, in certain circumstances. Um, and so we're going to step into the scriptures today and we're going to dissect uh, Matthew 22, starting at verse 34 today. It says this, when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they're talking of Jesus here, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. A lot of people say that this is an argument that started to break out with Jesus that the Sadducees and the Pharisees, that they were always plotting to, to get Jesus and to, to argue with him and to prove that he's wrong. But here, I think that there's something else going on in, the, in this picture. Because in this day, what would happen is that the Pharisees and the groups of rabbis, they would all gather and they would just have some spirited debate. It was great conversation that they would start to have. And so this lawyer, this Pharisee, came up and just posed Jesus a question. And it's not confrontational, but it was more of a practice of trying to figure out what God is saying to them. And so I think that this was just a normal piece uh, of what was going on. And that Pharisee said this to Jesus, Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? It's a great question. Because part of what they were doing during this time, during these debates, is there were 613 laws that the Jewish people had to follow and try to obey that they thought were from God. 613. And so this question was a very normal question for them. They would say, well, what, what commandment, what law out of those 613 is the most important? 
And then they would start to rank them. They would, they would go, well, this law is better than this law. And so there's a greater law. And then that's a lesser of the law. You, you can hear some of that language in scripture when you're reading it, that it'll say the greater of these commandments or the lesser of these. Like that language is, is very cultural in nature because they loved to rank they loved to try to figure out. And if someone said a law that was much lower on the list, they would f argue and debate and say, well, that law needs to be moved up because of this and this and that. So it's a great question that they engaged in. And Jesus said this to them as an answer to what the greatest law was. Great. He said to them, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. It's a very interesting answer that Jesus gave for lots of reasons. But first off, now that we've gone over what those four terminologies of Greek were, and now that you're all experts in uh, <laughs> what love means, right? We're experts now that we've had a two-minute explanation of them. That was a joke. We can laugh. I felt very disconnected from you in that moment, like I wasn't funny. <laughs> but he, that word love should pop out at you now. Well, what kind of love is Jesus talking about here? What, what is the term that he's using here? And here's the Greek word. And for you Greek people, I just love looking at Greek words. But this is the, the word agape, you shall love sacrificially. And so it's an interesting statement that Jesus makes here that you should love sacrificially to God. And it's, it's interesting to me because this whole idea of agape kind of love is that you are giving your entire being, you're laying down your life for God. And this makes sense to us. The, us, us who know who God is, us who know what following Jesus is about, we understand that there's this sacrificial nature to our relationship that is just foundational to who we are as followers of Jesus. It makes the second part of this statement almost a repetitive statement, that you will sacrifice everything by giving everything, your heart, mind, soul. It's almost like he's double repeating himself. In, in what it is. But he, it's an invitation into a deeper relationship with Christ. The, the other thing that I think is really interesting uh, about this answer is this, re, this, um, this story is recorded in three of the four Gospels. And in the Gospel of Mark, it actually starts by this, by saying, when Jesus answers, he says, um, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. That's how Mark records it. And then he goes on to say that you shall love the Lord your God. And basically what this is, is it comes from the book of Deuteronomy. It's a prayer. It's called the Shema. It's a Jewish prayer that was stated twice a day. And so as Jesus repeated the Shema to these uh, Pharisees who were ready for a spirited debate, it kind of probably threw them off kilter because this wasn't one of the laws, but rather this was a prayer that was spoken. And so they were probably set back on their heels a little bit that there's this new law of love that is being spoken for the first time through a very known prayer that they prayed twice a day. And he's saying there is this sacrificing love that you need to give God as the foundational law that we must follow, or that we as followers of, of God at the time, Christ for us, that is so important for us to understand and live into. Above all else, we follow and serve God sacrificially. What does that mean for us, though? I, 
I often wonder like that these are words, but like what is the practical nature of, of a sacrificial love to God? What does that look like for us? And here's my answer to that. If, if we have a sacrificial, agape kind of love to God, then we understand that we are to sacrifice ourselves for God. That he has something for each and every one of us to do, no matter how young, no matter how old, no matter if you're disabled or not, race, color, it doesn't matter who or what you are. If you are a follower of Christ, he has something for you to do. And not just do, to sacrifice to do. A sacrificial kind of love that if we are to follow God in an agape kind of way, that we are laying down all of the things that get in the way so that we can better serve him. And I wish I could tell you what those things were. I wish I could give you answers to what they are, but I don't know what God's asking you to do. I don't know what God is asking you to lay down to agape, sacrificially love him. But he's got something for you. The Holy Spirit wants to speak to you and call you into something. What is that? I think for me, no matter what it is, it just has to point us towards Christ. That when we sacrificially, agape kind of love God, that it has to point to Jesus. So whatever you're speaking, it points to Christ. Whatever you're doing at work, it points to Christ. Whatever you're doing in your family, it points to Christ. Whatever you are doing, wherever you are at, it points to Jesus. And if you are constantly pointing yourself to Jesus and aligning yourself to the person of Christ, you will be transformed and you will sacrifice bit by bit to give him your everything, that agape, sacrificial kind of love. So the verse goes on in Matthew uh, to say this, this is the greatest and first commandment. It's just everything I've been saying. That, that as we follow God in this way, in living a life of sacrifice to him, that it is just the greatest of all of the commandments. And what I think is really important about this is that it's not about rules, but it's about relationships. Notice how I said that there were 613 rules and Jesus stepped outside of those 613 rules and said, nope, it's not actually about those. Like you can debate what is most important out of all of these rules, but that is not what's the greatest thing for us. The greatest thing for any one of us is to be in relationship with God, to be in relationship with Jesus. So it is not about following the rules. It's about being in relationship with with Jesus. And as we're in relationship with Jesus, that transformational work happens with inside of us. Our hearts are opened and we're able to give that agape kind of love to God because we're in relationship with him. The verse goes on to say this, and a second rule, a second law is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There's that love word again. You should be looking at it going, I wonder what kind of love they're talking about here. They're talking about that philia, friendship kind of love. Are they talking about that uh, eros kind of love? Probably not, but you know, you got to be able to decipher, and we're going to get to what that means in a second. But before that, I want to also dive into the neighbors. Because I think that for myself, I get stuck on that word 
because when I think about loving my neighbor, I start to think about proximity. I've got a house to my left, a house to my right, and a field across from me. So my neighbor, I've got to go love my neighbors, right? Well, I don't think that that's exactly what this is pointing us towards, but rather, who is your neighbor? There's the, a story in Scripture uh, that actually kind of answers this question for us about who it is that is our neighbor. How do we treat people that are our neighbor? It's the story of the Good Samaritan. Do you guys remember that story? It's the story of, of someone being robbed and beaten on the, sto- on the street and people pass, right? Well, if you read that story, you get a good sense of what being a neighbor is. And what it says through that story is it's that person who needs mercy is given mercy. Who needs mercy is the one who is your neighbor. That's the one who deserves it. And the way that I would verbalize that is showing the love of Christ to whoever needs it. That's who our neighbor is. Do you know anybody who needs to experience the love of Christ? Do you see people in your own world, in your own atmosphere, that need to hear that loving, hope-filled voice of Jesus? Because they're your neighbor. They're the ones that need to experience it. So there's the word again. It's asking us to love our neighbor in an agape kind of way. It's the same word. I don't think it's an accident that that this author says that we have to have sacrificial love to God, which makes sense, but we also have to take that sacrificial love and be sacrificial to those who need to, to experience Christ. It's laying down our wants, laying down our desires, laying down and sacrificing. There's a, a piece to this, um, ver- of this agape that is actually action-based, that it takes action to make this work in the way that it's supposed to, that it can't just be words, it just can't be uh, thoughts, got to be action-based, sacrificially action-based. And there's a verse that helps us understand that. It says this out of 1 John 4, 7, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because there it is again, what we talked about at the beginning, God is love. This verse basically is saying that if you know God, you can share love. But if you don't know God, you don't have him, you're incapable of loving the way that scripture talks about loving in an agape kind of way. Because this love comes from God. It's like when when you are in relationship with God, you experience and you know what sacrificial love. It's the only sacrificial love that we have as an example uh, with Christ on the cross. And once you see that and understand the ultimate sacrifice of love, you're able to digest that in your heart and it transforms you. And it's like God comes in and only God can push that love out. So if we want our neighbors to experience love, if we want people to understand love, the only people that can share this kind of love are those people who know God. And that's us. We are the ones who know God and can share it, digest it, and give it. We can't leave it to other people because they don't know agape kind of love. God is love. And it's only through his transformational work, 
through us that we can give it. And agape love is demonstrated through action. It's things that, that literally take us and move us towards action. And I was really dwelling on this this week. I was thinking, God, well, what kind of examples can I, I share of Is that me? Holy cow. How can I give some examples of what this looks like? Right? And so I sat down and I started to think. I started to process. And this looks like a list I'm about to share with you that's really good, right? Because these were the thoughts that came into my mind. I I thought about that one time that I was at the gas station and I was filling up my gas tank and I felt like, Chris, you've got to go over there and sacrifice some of your money and fill up that person's gas tank. But I didn't do it. I thought to myself, that's my money. I'm not going to go do that. I thought about a time when I was at work and while I was at work, I was in the middle of something and someone was laid on my heart and, and I, I felt like, oh, I have really got to call that person. I got to go visit that person. I think that that person really just needs uh, some space and some time to talk right now. But then I thought to myself, mm, I'm too busy. I, I can't do that. I, I, not right now. I don't, I don't have the time. I, I, I'm just going to keep going right now. I thought about that time when I was at uh, another church of mine and I felt like I had to go serve in this ministry and, and they were asking for volunteers and I thought to myself, ah, I'm not going to do that. Like, even though I felt like I was supposed to, I remember saying, I, I just don't have time for that. I, I don't have the space for that nah, and I don't really like that. So I I didn't do it. The last one is a little bit of a sidestep, but it still weighed heavy on my heart. The the times where I've been in my own home and I've been on my phone or on my computer and I hear my daughter say, will you play a game with me, Daddy? And I think to myself, I don't want to do that. No. Quinn, plug your ears. I don't want to do that. I want to, I want to just stare at my phone and blank out. My engagement in relationship was not what it was supposed to be, even though I felt like, oh, just put the phone down and go, right? Every one of these things are rooted in something that is alive inside of me and I believe is probably in alive in many of us. And that's selfishness. Selfishness takes us away from doing this hard, action-based, agape kind of love. Because agape kind of love means that I walk over and I sacrifice and fill the gas tank. Agape kind of love means I put down my time frame for work and I go visit who needs to because it's a sacrifice and I know that that's what I'm supposed to be doing. Agape kind of love is serving even though I don't have the time and I don't really want to. Agape kind of love is putting down things that I would rather be doing so that I'm able to engage family, friends in a deeper kind of level. I'm sacrificing for others. I'm sacrificing by doing things because God's asking me to do those sacrificial kinds of things. And yes, I have failed at it. But I'm trying to learn myself how to experience that agape kind of love and to work through selfishness. To put my own stuff away so that God's love can be experienced through 
me. And that's one of the reasons that this is a priority of Jesus. That we understand his sacrifice that he made for us so that we too can sacrifice to share that love outward so that others can experience that love of Christ. It's circular in motion and we are an intimate part of that wheel. God is using us to share that kind of love. So I'm going to read this verse to you. It comes out of Corinthians. And this is, we're going to get to the second part of this here in a second. This is your typical wedding kind of Bible verse. This is read at a lot of weddings. I was about to say most weddings, but a lot of weddings this verse is read at. But I also think that this is taken a little bit out of context Um, so when you read this and hear the reading of this, don't get all the wedding bell jitters happiness because I think that it actually goes a little bit deeper than that. So listen to these words out of uh, 1 Corinthians 13. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast but do not have love, I gain nothing. Do you hear those same kind of overtones that we were listening to from that verse where it says that if you want to understand love, you've got to know God because God is foundational to understanding love. This is a continuation of that same thought. He's saying you can do all the nice things in the world. You can can be smart. You can be wise. You can do all the right things, say all the right things, but if it is not based out of agape, sacrificial kind of love, it's nothing. We have nothing. No matter what good you do, no matter what you say that's kind, it's nothing if it is not driven by the sacrificial nature of Jesus. It's nothing. You've got nothing if you're not in the know of driving that kind of love forward, not only for God, but for your neighbor. And here's the wedding bells. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. These are action-based words. These are not words that are spoken to do nothing with. Every one of these is a verb and it gives action. Agape kind of action and love. We are asked to join in action with the mystery of God as followers of his. We take his love and we push his love out. So this Matthew verse ends like this. On these two commandments hang all the law and all the prophets. Those 613 verses. Jesus is saying, listen, like you guys can sit here and argue all day which of those verses are the best. What laws are higher and lower? Like argue all you want. But everything that comes from the mouth of God, all of the laws, all of the commandments fall under these two simple yet hard things to do. Agape kind of love. You don't believe me? Open up to Exodus 20. Check out the Ten Commandments. Just walk through the Ten Commandments and you'll see how every one of these fall under two categories, loving God or loving your neighbor. Loving people. You just walk through them. You shall have no other gods before me, loving God. 
You shall not take, make idols. Agape love for God. You shall not take the name of the Lord or your God in vain. Agape love for God. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Agape love for God. The rest of them from there down are all agape love for your neighbor. Being able to share in action the love of Christ to others. All action-based. All his laws, all his commandments hang on these two things. And it's our responsibility and how we deal with that. This verse that we're going to end on here is so good for us to hear. Because as, as we wrap up here, we really need to remember that the priorities of Jesus are, f- are foundational to this principle of love. Everything that we're going to now talk about moving forward in, in the next four or five weeks, we need to hold with it this idea of love. That when God's love enters us, it transforms us. It changes us. It makes us into a new creation that the old ways of understanding love are gone and the new ways of understanding love reside within us so that we can send that out. In this past year, I would say that I've contemplated and experienced death in a way and in a deeper way that I think I ever have other, other ways. I've seen lots of friends in hospital beds. I've seen lots of church members pass away. I wish you could all see the list of how many church members have passed away this year because there's a lot. I've experienced my own family passing away this year. I've had a stint in a hospital bed this year and, and through all of that, and I know this sounds like a morose, sad way to end this message, thinking and contemplating death, but The reason that I'm doing that is because when it's all said and done, when, when death actually happens to any one of us, nothing matters except one thing. I mean, you've heard it said many times in many sermons if, if you've been around the church that y- you don't get to take stuff. You don't, get to, you don't get to change past. You don't get to do a lot of stuff. But Scripture becomes clear. This is actually at the end of that Corinthians verse that we spent some time in, the wedding bell verse, like I like to call it. It says this, And now these three things remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. And again, what kind of love are they talking about in this scripture? It's agape love again. They're saying that philios love, eros love, storhe love, none of those remain. Agape love, sacrificial, laying down yourself, laying down your selfish desires kind of love is all that will remain at the end. So for me, the encouragement in this is to leave all the other stuff and concentrate on the two things that truly matter, the two things that everything hang in balance on, and that's loving God sacrificially and loving others sacrificially. Nothing else matters. I just hope and pray that today you too can Open up your heart 
and listen to what the Holy Spirit is speaking to you in what remains in your life. How are you going to express this kind of love in your own love, in your own life, this love in your own life? So at the end, you'll be able to say, I have love that will remain. So please pray with me now as we enter into our closing song. Jesus, your love is so much bigger than any one of us knows or understands. If any one of us can fathom what you did on that cross for us, if any one of us can fully get that you are the epitome example of what sacrificial love looks like. Help us to get just a small slice of that love so that we can be transformed by it and then give it outward. Holy Spirit, speak to each and every one of our hearts and our lives so that we can be love in action. Do these things now, we pray, Jesus. Amen. Amen. I want to invite you to stand one more time, if you would like to, as we just continue um, by singing our last song. I always find it, it I guess it just makes me smile. Um, I only get scripture when when I'm choosing the songs and I'm praying, asking God, Lord, what do you want to hear this week? What do you want to hear? And I always begin by reading the scripture. And sometimes that scripture leads to the songs being very easy to choose. And sometimes I'm, I only get maybe one of the scriptures, even though there's going to be four or five. And this week that was, that was the case. I only had Matthew. And I knew we were going to talk about love. And I just began to ask, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, lead me, lead me. And this week's songs did not come as easy as in some prior. And one of the songs that did come to me was One Thing Remains. And I thought, okay, One Thing Remains. Yeah, that talks about love. It could, it could possibly fit. Okay, Holy Spirit, we'll go with that. One thing remains. And I actually had it as our second song. And Chris uh, sent me an email and said, I was looking over your songs, and wow, the one that spoke to me the most was One Thing Remains. Can we do that as our closing song? And I thought, sure, we, we, we can do that. That's fine. And as I sit here and I listen so what he just preached about, agape love. I think about the words of this song and I feel almost overwhelmed because Jesus sacrificed for all of us. So when we sing, your love never fails, never gives up, and never runs out on me. I feel like it means something different after hearing that message. Jesus has agape love for us, sacrificial love, that no matter what we do, no matter how far we run away, he comes after us and says, I love you, not just any love, but the love that is sacrificial. He do anything and did do everything for us. So this morning, I just want to invite you to maybe close your eyes or however you feel comfortable to worship, but just worship him because he loves us and he deserves the sacrificial love from us this morning. Let's sing this together. Your love never fails.
So go now, experiencing that sacrificial love that only Christ can give you. Go in his peace and take that love and sacrificially give it outward. Have a great day.